this presentation on the Smith & Wesson handguns, now commonly known as the Victory Models, that were used in the Second World War by both the United States and Allied nations, predominantly the United Kingdom. The best reference books for people who really want to get into this is U.S. Handguns of World War II, the Secondary Pistols and Revolvers by Charles Pat. That's been out for a good number of years. I don't know whether a second edition is coming out, but it covers a lot of the guns outside of the 1911 series. One of the best to follow the Commonwealth is the 380 Enfield No. 2 Revolver by Mark Stamps and Ian Skedderton. And it gives you a lot of information on what was going on in regard to uh, the handguns that Britain had to use in World War II. Even though the book's focus is on the number two revolver, it gives you a lot of information on the Victory and other guns that were purchased by the British. Mm -hmm. Now, if we go over here, okay, we will see a selection of four revolvers that ended up working for the United Kingdom, and two of them are marked and have Smith & Wesson letters indicating they went to Canada. Now, when Britain originally was, you know, getting ready for World War II, uh, they had the capacity in the Enfield Armory to make their own handguns. And as a backup, they had the commercial Webley firm, which would also give them, uh, make handguns for them. But in spring, actually in May of 1940, when France fell, uh, Britain realized they were in a world of hurt when it came to handguns. And they actually got to the point where they were buying almost anything shootable that Colton Smith & Wesson or Ivor Johnson had in the factory. And as long as they could get a handgun and a box of ammunition with it or a couple of boxes, they were sending it over. But what they really wanted was guns in what they call 380-200. What had happened is Britain had decided after the First World War that the 455 was too difficult for the average soldier to learn how to handle properly. And at that time, Smith & Wesson had the 38 S and W, also called Colt New Police. And they also had a 38 Special, which had more punch. And they had another one that was called the Super Police, which was a 38 Special with a 200 grain bullet. And what happened was, Britain sort of combined the two. They took the 200 grain bullet from the 38 Super Police, put it in the 38 S and W case, and created the 380-200, which they felt would be an adequate man stopper, uh, comparable to their 455. Well, eventually Britain ran into a little problem. They had prosecuted Irish rebels for, for using dumb dumb bullets because the Irish rebels in the Rising had used Mauser 71s with lead bullets. Well, here's the British Army issuing handguns with lead bullets. So they decided to change the bullet and go to a full metal jacket of 173 grains, and that becomes the 380-200 by name, but it's no longer 200 grains, it's a full metal jacket, 173 grain bullet. Now, in this selection here, we're going to start with the first one in the sort of numerical sequence by serial number, and that's the gun up here. It's six inch commercial blue finish, checkered grips with the Smith & Wesson medallion, and it's got a lanyard swivel. And just bear with me as I read you the Smith & Wesson letter that goes. The revolver you inquired about is a special model 38 hand ejector military and police model of 1905, fourth change, which was manufactured for the British Commonwealth nations between 1940 and 1945. This model was designated to fire the shorter 38 Smith & Wesson cartridge, which was loaded with a 200 grain bullet. Therefore, the model was nicknamed the 38200 British Service Revolver. In 1940, when this model was first sold to the British Purchasing Commission, it was serial numbered in the original 38 military and police serial range, beginning at approximately serial number 700,000 and dispensed throughout the range until the serial number reached 1 million. At this time, a new serial number series commenced beginning with the prefix V and continued through serial number VS825000 with shipments numbering over a broad serial range of this series. This new V series serial number series was called the Victory Model Series, but the 38200 revolver can be distinguished from the standard Victory Model by their caliber. 
Smith & Wesson manufactured a total of 571,629 of these revolvers for the British Commonwealth countries. They were supplied in the following manner between June 1940 and December 1940. A total of 112,854 were sold directly to the British Purchasing Commission between February 1940 and June 1941. 21,347 were sold to the Union of South Africa between June 1940 and December 1941. 45,328 were sold to Canada. In April 1941, 8,000 were sold to Australia. The remaining 384,100 shipped between 1941 and the end of World War II were supplied by U.S. Army Ordnance through the Lend-Lease Program to Britain for distribution. These guns were sold in three variations of finishes. Early guns being of the Smith & Wesson bright blue, then changed to a darker midnight black finish, and finally to parkerized finish. The most common barrel length is 5 inch. However, limited quantities of 4 and 6 inch barrel lengths were also supplied. At the close of World War II, these guns were sold as surplus. Many were converted to the more popular 38 Special, which I'm going to get into. I call them Lee Harvey Oswald Specials, and I'll explain. And some were sleeved and converted to 22 caliber. It is important to note that this revolver should not be converted to 38 Special, nor should the new plus P ammunition be used if the gun has been converted to that caliber. We have researched your Smith & Wesson 38-200 British service model, British government contract, caliber 38 Smith & Wesson and company records, which indicate your handgun was shipped from our factory on January 19, 1941, delivered to the British Purchasing Commission, New York City, New York. Factory records show it was shipped with a 6-inch barrel, blue finish, and checkered walnut grips. And if you look here closely on the actual gun, let's get over here. <clears throat> You can see in that corner, that's a Canadian acceptance mark, all right? About half of the six-inch guns were shipped, ended up in Canada, all right? And if I can find that, I have the actual statistics somewhere here, but... Yeah, they're far more common found in, with Canadian markings. For some reason, Canada seemed to have a, a preference for those. I mean, I just went and found some material here. Okay. Now, when the guns were first being made, some were made with four-inch blued finish. Okay? And they were in two orders. 229 in the first order, 4,879 in the second order. Of the second order, 13,847 were sent to South Africa. Okay? So basically, that's where they are. They, uh, for them to appear in an American collection is going to be very difficult and probably expensive. All right, the five inches were more common. Six inch, there was an order of 1,151, then 20,000, then 325, then 16,000. 18,160 went to Canada. All right, so you're more likely to run into a Canadian Mark six inch if you do find them. Now, the guns were also called Smith & Wesson number two K200 revolvers. The original commercial blue was done until about December of 1941. Then they went to a brush blue, which I think the second gun is. And that went to April of 1942. And then they went to phosphate gray, which we call parkerized. And that's the most common you're going to run into is the parkerized, which we'll get into over here. Let me see if I have any more information on the back. Well, I just did some computations. Um, 0.03% of all these guns were 4-inch, and like I said, 95% of them are in South Africa. Uh, when it comes to 6-inch, 0.6%, almost 7% of all the guns were 6-inch, and approximately, well, 47.6% of them ended up in Canada. And um, the total number of guns sold to the British 500, or to the Commonwealth, let me take that back, 555,929. So I got a half a million of them that went to the Commonwealth. All right. All right. Now, the second gun that we have here is a five inch with a bluish finish. You can see it's probably the, not the commercial blue, but pretty close to it. Probably the brush blue. And that too has a Canadian acceptance mark. 
I got it. Okay. Now, according to the letter from the factory, we have researched your Smith & Wesson United States. It's a Lend-Lease contract, caliber 38. Indicate that your handgun was shipped from our factory March 19th, 1942, and delivered to the Hartford Ordnance Depot, 95 State Street, Springfield, Massachusetts. Local distribution center for Lend-Lease. Factory records indicate it was shipped with a 5-inch barrel, sandblasted blue finish, and smooth walnut grips. And that's just what it appears to have. All right, the next gun in our series is going to be right here is a Smith & Wesson Victory model. Well, I call it a Victory model. It doesn't have a V. It's 953,000. And it's unusual in that the front sight has been cut from a half moon and put a ramp on it. And on the back, very finely machined lines to give you a better grip. Why this particular gun was done this way, I have no idea. I'll eventually have to get a factory letter. Maybe they took something off the commercial line in a hurry and, and produce it. By 1940, 19, late 1941, basically all Smith & Wesson was doing was cranking out five-inch revolvers for the Commonwealth. And we're going to get into what happened with the Victory model. Now, over here is a gun that's in perfect condition, all right, and there's a reason for that, all right. This one here was imported into the United States in the 1980s, and it has an import mark on it. It has, also has markings that are very difficult to see, but I'm going to flip it over right in this area. This is a factory thorough repair done in MA, which is Munitions Australia. A factory in 1955. Factory thorough repair meant they took the gun and made it the way it was when it left the factory. They replaced any parts, they refinished it, whatever it took to make it the same as it would be as if it had just left the factory. And you find a good number of these were imported into the country in the late 1980s. Uh, Australia continued to use this gun for quite a while. Now, if you look at W.H.B. Smith's Small Arms of the World, starting in 1944, 1945, he shows this gun with the notation, a favorite of the commandos. Uh, combat veterans that were armed with a 38 in, in the UK preferred the Smith & Wesson over the Webley or the Enfield. So given a choice, if they were carrying a 38, that's the one they tried to get their hands on. Um, if you were a commando, though, a 1911 automatic or a 17 revolver gave you compatibility with your Thompson, but if you were going to carry a revolver, uh, this might be the gun you want, okay? They were very popular. Now, little war story. My unit at Fort Dix, there was a guy who showed me his gun, and he brought me one of these. And I go, where'd you get it? He goes, Vietnam. I go, you got to tell me the story. <laughs> he goes, easy. He says, I was an infantry platoon leader, and we were sent on a, on a body re recovery mission. And he said, and I pulled this gun out of the dead pilot's shoulder holster. So how a 38 s and uh, ended up in Vietnam in the holster of a, the dead American helicopter pilot is another story. But he smuggled the gun back. Now, we do know that the federal government, the U.S. government, was buying these guns and keeping some of them because they used them to equip the Japanese police force after World War II. They used it in Bavaria. And there are records that the OSS was getting guns in 38 s and to drop to, you know, friendly partisans or whatever. So the U.S. retained a good number in a non-standard caliber. Now, if you're a collector, these are nice. What you got to watch out for, and this letter warns you about guns converted to 38 special, don't use plus P's, is what I refer to as Lee Harvey Oswald specials. Uh, when Oswald killed Officer Tippett, he was armed with a victory model that had no lanyard and the barrel was cut right there, right where the lug is. How's it going? All right, where the lug is. And the barrel was cut right there and they put a new rear sight right there. And they kept the long ejector rod. The really rare victory models are two inch snub nose, original factory. 
Now, 500 or so were made during the war and sent to the OSS, and one was kept by the uh, kept by the uh, Smith and Wesson factory or the or the estate, and one somehow ended up in the central police department. So, what we have here is again the evolution of the 38 revolver, and then we're going to get to the U.S. model, which is commonly called the Victory. Okay, over here we have a display of what the British call pistol cases, which we call holsters. Okay, starting over here, these are very common in the United States. These are made in Canada, ZT, I think it stands for Zephyr Limited. And they originally were designed to take the Webley, the Smith & Wesson 455, the Colt New Service in 455, but they were also good for the Smith & Wesson 6-inch barrel guns fit in here real nice, okay? But most guns that Britain wanted were the 5-inch size, so there's a variety of holsters here. This one here is an example of what not to do when you're a young collector like I was. This cost me, I think, $2, and I didn't like the flap on it, so I cut it off, and I used to use it. Years later, to find a replacement, I had to lay out $100 <laughs> to get the same holster with the leg strap. And these were designed for uh, tankers, and it would hang down, you know, and the thing, it's funny thing about it is, I get, I've seen a good number of pictures with these with um, Smith & Wesson revolvers. It's nice, you, can, you know, you hold the ammunition right here, okay, and, you know, in the loops, it, it, it's nice in that, in that sense, okay. Don't go around cutting off the strap, all right. Um, over here is the more common type holster for the, for the Victory model. It's also for the Enfields, also for the Webley 38. And this one here is marked 1943, all right. So you have your belt. And the way the British carried ammunition were in these pouches. Now, you were issued theoretically 12 rounds. And it would fit in this pouch. Now the pouch, there's two versions you gotta be careful of if you're a collector. This one here, which I'm gonna, it's gonna try to open, it's not gonna snap open. It's gonna fight me today, right? And it opened so nice yesterday. Uh -uh. It's gonna fight me, okay. Uh, if it's unlined, it's for pistol ammo. If it has a nice felt lining, it's for the compass. <laughs> okay. But people use them interchangeably. So I, I, this one here might be the one with the felt lining. Or maybe that one over there. But um, they were designed really to be for the compass. But guys, I'm sure would use them. Yeah, there it is. As you can see the lining. For the compass. For the compass. And this is an example of the ammunition. This is full metal jacket, which is hard to find in the U.S. Most of the time, you, you know, 38 S&W. But this is the full metal jacket that they decided would better meet the requirements of the Hague Convention of 1899, which the United States never signed, but that's another story. But our policy is we will follow the Convention of 1899. And that's what really requires full metal jacket. Although there's some argument now that the United States might go to hollow points for uh, counterterrorism operations. Okay, this is the holster for the military police. It's white in color. I thought I had brought one, but I have RAF holsters. They're blue in color. They're like this blue or like this in blue. So you'll find a variety of colors. Khaki is the most common that you're going to find for your British, uh, your British holsters. Now I'm noticing with the British holsters, they have a, um, a hole at the bottom. Yes, for, for draining. Water, for and draining. this is the smart part. They actually have a place where you put your cleaning rod. Okay. Which I only, they're hard to find the cleaning rods, but I have one here. Okay. But, uh, cleaning rod, and let me see, let me open this one up. Oh, yeah, the lanyard. British lanyards. Okay. Which you can attach to your pistol, whether it's a Webley or whatever. But I've seen a good number of these particular holsters with uh, Smith & Wesson revolvers, even though they're, they're all-purpose mm -hmm. for everything. Like I said, if you have a 6-inch, you sort of need the big holster. These are all designed really for the 5-inch. All right, let's go on to the uh, American Victory models. Okay. Now, when we get to the United States, here's what started to happen. Britain was, of course, monopolizing the Smith & Wesson factory in 1940, cranking out all the, all the pistols that they needed. 
The Navy wanted military and police revolvers for their civilian police force that was being used to guard naval bases. And they basically told Smith and Wesson, you know, we need revolvers too. But we don't want them 38 200 or 38 SFF. We want them 38 special, which is what we already have. So the contract was signed and the Navy started to get blue revolvers, but then eventually with the victory models, they started to get parkerized finish lanyard loop. Now, this one here is unusual and it has NYMI. When I got this, nobody knew what it was. It was many years later before reference books came out. It stands for Naval Yard Mare Island, which is a facility out in California that does a lot of ship repair. And what happened was, um, they were marked U.S. Navy, and now some are marked property U.S. Navy engraved right on the side. Those are also highly desirable collector items. NYMI, highly desirable collector items. The ones that mess people up are the ones marked USMC. All you jarhead collectors go nuts over that. Here's the problem. USMC on a victory means United States Maritime Commission. Okay, not the Marine Corps. Later on, the Maritime Commission changed its, didn't, kept its name, but it's got a different acronym because I guess USMC is a copyrighted trademark of the Marine Corps. So you've got, I said, a victory model. One of these is marked US Navy on top. This one is marked, hey, it's very shallow. This one here is US property. Well, maybe it's this one. Yeah, U.S. Navy. It's marked U.S. Navy, but it's very shallow engraving. And the problem you can sometimes run into when you're a collector is people thought that they shouldn't have the U.S. property marking, whatever, and they would just buff it right out. And you'll, you'll find victory models where there's nothing on top. There was something on top, okay? It either said U.S. Navy, United States property, or U.S. property, okay? But... Again, some people thought that, you know, once they bought him as a civilian gun, they had to remove that. Now, the most famous use of the victory was John F. Kennedy. John F. Kennedy, when he commanded PT-109, had a victory model and six rounds of ammunition. His men had 45 automatics, and it was Thompson submachine gun aboard the boat, too. In addition to the 37-millimeter anti-tank gun he had mounted on the front and the 50 calibers. When Kennedy swam out, to try to rescue, draw attention, he, he took his victory model with a lanyard, put it around his neck and let it drag behind him as he swam out to the middle of the, uh, the bay there. He fired three shots, which was supposed to be the recognition that, you know, you're in trouble, you need help, but nobody heard him. So when he got back, he only had three rounds left. Uh, later on, when they ran into some natives carrying Japanese rifles, you know, they were ready to go to combat, and they found out they were people working with the Australian Coast Watchers. So they worked out an agreement where the Coast Watcher would come near them, and as a recognition, he would fire three shots, they would fire four shots. Well, Kennedy only had three rounds left in his revolver, but luckily the Coast Watchers natives had a Japanese rifle. So Kennedy fired off his last three rounds. He then picked up the Jap rifle, and I guess not being familiar with a rifle, he fired it, and the recoil almost knocked him out of the canoe. <laughs> but he got his fourth shot off and was rescued. Um, Victory models stayed in the inventory for quite a while. And uh, as late as 1970, the Air Force still had Victory models, which they would issue to soldiers with small hands. The standard gun for the Air Police was the combat masterpiece, and it had commercial... Colt, oh, it's commercial, sorry, Smith and Wesson larger grips. But um, now, over here is an army manual or technical manual on the military and police revolver from 1985. From my own experience as a military police officer, we were supposed to have Smith and Wesson round frame revolvers for females. In reality, we never saw them. We trained our females on the 45 automatic. They carried the 45 automatic on duty. Uh, but in theory, we were supposed to get Smith & Wesson uh, revolvers with the rounded grips for, for every female. 
There are three holsters during the Second World War, all right? The one on the right there, the brown flap, it's a picture of one here from an article from the American Rifleman. Okay. For a while there, I thought it was a phony because the dark color I'd never seen on any other uh, holster. And there are absolutely no markings except for the U.S. embossed on the cover. So I thought it might be a repro. Maybe it is, but I have that one. These two I know are original holsters. This one here, on the back, if you can get a good close-up, that's Craig's head. They were a big holster maker. They made 45 holsters and so forth. And it's dated 1943. Uh, so that one I know is an authentic holster. Now, the, the big flap one, they just pictures of them. Now, you got to remember that Smith & Wesson victories were also given to civilian factories for their security guards. As a matter of fact, some are marked BAC, which stands for Boeing Aircraft Corporation. And when the war was over, Boeing offered the guards to buy the guns. They could buy the guns and take them home in those days, you know, if you wanted a souvenir of your time as a security guard. So a victory models are not necessarily combat guns. The most likely ones that were used in combat were worn in these holsters. And we'll get the marking on the back here so you can get nice, see if you can get nice and clear. Should say Boyd U.S. Navy. Yep. Okay. USN Boyd 44. Okay. Now, these holsters cost $1.35 each, and they were sent to the Navy for their pilots because this was the standard handgun for aviators, either Marine or Navy aviators. The Victory model was the standard handgun. Uh, the reason for that was they wanted to save the 45s for combat troops in the mud. And, you know, a pistol for a pilot, American pilot, is probably as useful as a samurai sword was for a Japanese pilot. But, but when the holsters arrived, what they would often do is they would have riggers and loops for a car. Because there was no, when the holster left the factory, that was it. It was a holster. Right here? Yeah. And a lot of times they would have riggers add loops. They would find some kind of elastic material and anywhere from six to lots of, of uh, holsters, I mean, lots of ammunition. Now, during the Vietnam War, you will sometimes run into black holsters with victory models, all right? In 1958, the U.S. went from, uh, from brown leather to black leather. So you'll get holsters like this. And what a lot of times they would do, this is a JP. JP was a big police supplier when, they, when I was on the department, JP. And they made these that you put on your, on your uh, garrison belts. And what they would do is pilots would take these and mount them right on their shoulder straps. And sometimes they'd mount a bunch of these. And some of them you know, went out like Pancho Villa with 100, you know, 50 rounds of 38 special. But the issue holster they had no provision for extra ammunition. And this was more of a thing that guys would rig up you know, during the Vietnam era for pilots to carry some extra ammunition. Now, what ammunition did you carry? Well, if you were a pilot, you had your GI ball ammunition. I think I have an example up here. It's full metal jacket. Same thing the British did, okay? And the tracer rounds, okay? You might carry, oop, that's a hollow point. No, that wouldn't be it. Let's see, where is it? I thought I had some here. Yeah, full metal jacket. And you would carry tracer rounds because what you would do is load your victory model if you were and you're floating in your little dinghy in the middle of the Pacific and you saw approaching aircraft that you identified as U.S., you might fire a few rounds into the air, tracer rounds, and hope that that would draw attention. So it was, it was your impromptu flare pistol also. And of course for self-defense in the few situations where you might actually be called upon to shoot it out with the enemy, you might want some ammunition. So. Um, I want to get a close-up yeah. on this one. Other, are there any other notable or famous people that carry the victory models no, they, besides? They actually, the only well, aviator, Pappy Boynton, the Marine Corps aviator, he had you know, but he was an aviator, so he had the issue holster and uh, the victory model was there. Um, the Lee Harvey Oswald special, unfortunately, as I refer to it, um, 
that he used when he shot and he murdered Officer Tibbet. Um, victory models were very common when I was a young collector, and I'm glad I didn't buy some because a lot of them were converted to 38 Special, and it's not a great conversion. It, it, uh, they, chain, they, they remount the chamber, and if you fire it and you eject the empties, a good criminal science investigator can pick up the empties and know you have a converted 38 200 because they, they, they don't fit right. And the barrel diameter is not ideal for the 38 special round. So what you basically have, you're a collector, I always tell people, if you run into one that's British and it's converted, walk by. You know, unless you want it as an inexpensive shooter in the house, you know, that's about it. From a collector point of view, you want one that's still original caliber. Now, what they would often do is just mark SPL on the side of the barrel because the US ones are marked 38 S&W Special. The Commonwealth guns are marked 38 Smith & Wesson. Hmm. And of course, the two calibers are not interchangeable unless you modify the firearm accordingly. And then, again, it's from the collector point of view, you don't want to convert the one that, from an inexpensive home defense gun, maybe. You know, somebody sells it to you real cheap. Now, values, okay, that's always a question that jumps around. Um, when this article was written for the American Rifleman in 2007, um, they said 750 mark for a, a victory model. And with ones that are British going for the last probably 500, that's 2007. Uh, they were a sleeper collectible. That's really one of the things. That at first, they were there, there was a lot of them. A um, good number of them were given to police departments for their auxiliary police. And then when, the, then when the police departments started transitioning to automatics, they unloaded all their revolvers. So you would get nice blue Smith and & Wessons and Colts, and all of a sudden they would throw in a bunch of victory models that were uh, used by the auxiliary police. And uh, What does this say on the barrel right here? Uh, probably had the patent dates, Smith okay. & Wesson. So right now, back in 2007, 750, currently 2016, <laughs> say. Yeah, I'm seeing them go for 800, 900, even 1,000 like this, NYMI, because it's the unique marking. Mm -hmm. The other one, it's marked U.S. Navy on the side, engraved. Those are in great demand. Your standard victory, U.S. property, 38 specials are probably going in the 700 to $800 range. There's a point where people just go, it's, that's a lot of money, you know, it's... Holsters are very hard to find. That, I'll tell you, that is a problem if you want an original World War II holster. Lots of uh, the black leather holsters that were made for the Vietnam era guns, um, yeah, they're around. They're, they're like $20, $25 items, you know. Leather holsters like this will cost you a lot. Uh, your British holsters are still inexpensive. Uh, Webley holsters like this go for thirty to fifty dollars. I would say thirty to fifty dollar range. The leg drops, those will run you a hundred. I would say the the belt one with the loops on the outside probably go for sixty to seventy dollars. Ammo pouches are hard to find because nobody thought, I guess, of saving them or knowing what they were for. So you know they were just out there and nobody realized that a lot of times they're sold as first aid pouches. I've seen them. At gun shows, the guys will have first aid pouch, ten dollars. Okay, I know what it is. <laughs> if it's lined, it's a compass pouch, but it'll take ammo. And externally, they look the same, basically. So, mm -hmm. if you see a compass pouch, don't go, don't, don't hold your nose before you buy it. Yeah. It'll, it'll look good on your belt <laughs> for, for purposes. Yeah. Now, how do you load one of these? Sure. Okay, these are all standard Smith and Wesson type revolvers. Okay, we do this. On a Smith & Wesson, you push forward and open up for the cylinder. On a Colt, you pull back. Insert six rounds, close it, and then you have your choice of double action or single action. When you're done, push down, spin out, hit the ejector rod right there, and your empty should drop out. Nice. And again, when I was on the police force, you know, we were trained to go like this real hard, to tilt it up, hit it real hard to eject all the empties. 
But of course, revolvers are obsolete. No police department's going to issue revolvers anymore. Yeah. We'll do a special on that one day. We'll do revolvers, police revolvers. But, uh, you know, you would load. The trouble is, it's loose rounds. And, you know, you, I would train to put two at a time, two at a time, three times, and close the cylinder. And then we were trained, and I, I can't do it anymore from memory, but you would, if you were in a hurry and you couldn't load everything, you, you had nowhere to position it when you closed it, so when you fired it, it would bang, not click. But it's again, the revolver is an obsolete design. It's, it's had its day as a combat weapon. No, one's, no army's gonna issue revolvers. No police department in America is gonna go to revolvers. Yeah. All right, let's start shooting. All right. What do you want to shoot? Come on.
first or second Full metal jacket, full metal jacket, hollow point, full metal jacket, full metal jacket, full metal jacket, hollow point, soft point, soft point, not hollow point, soft point. You never what I have here. No, I don't. A lot of people do. Why? Just for the cross? Okay, I'm going to. Victory model with full metal jacket, GI type ammunition. Six rounds, cylinder closed. Ah, from the old days. Let me see if I can do this right. Actually, I carried it, uh, an official police, but. <laughs> <laughs> but I bought a Smith & Wesson, then I left the department, so I still have my. Yeah, there was a big argument for a while in the late 70s about quality of Smith & Wesson versus Colt. Mm -hmm. A lot of the old timers were complaining that the quality had gone downhill and this is the oh this is what I should have been using. This is the special uh, nightclad indoor ammunition. That uh, theoretically at least less pollution. Huh. The trouble is people used to confuse them with the armor piercing ones. <laughs> Now there's lead in there. Let me see if we get less smoke out of these. Theoretically designed to give you a. Uh... All right. Let's see. Let's see how much smoke comes out of them. Load when I, despite all the evidence that it was marginal, a lot of departments had to stick to it because chiefs would say, that's what I carried when I was a patrolman. <laughs> I never had problems with it. All right, so 158 grain, standard police load. Okay, wait. Something 
got wrong there. Okay, make sure they're all seated properly. Something is not right. Let's see. When you hear it go different than normal. That's kind of like half a shot. All right, it cleared the barrel, whatever it was. That one was not a good sound. Something you have to watch for. Yeah, whenever you fire a gun, if it sounds different, stop and check. It can be anything, including one plugged in the barrel. The way we were trained in those days was you pull two of them off your loop together and uh, you can see the gymnastics of doing this, right? It's not good. Or we had a drop box, you would open it, and theoretically six rounds fell into your hand and not on the floor. And then you would load them. But I was trained to do two rounds at a time from a, from a belt. Theoretically, you pulled out two and stuck them into two cylinders. As a matter of fact, I'm, I'm going to go back and get you the, the thing. Let's, let's try it again. somehow skipped one. That can also happen, so then when the gun gets old, it actually... Now, if I go, okay, this gun has been fired. Notice if I tilt it up, the live round will come right out. Because mm -hmm. the other ones have all expanded into the cylinder. And then you would hit it, and eject the other ones out. Okay, just hold here, I'm gonna get something, I'll be right back. Theoretically, yeah. now we're talking police techniques circa 1970s, okay? <laughs> Like I said, this would be on your belt somewhere, and you would, with two fingers, pull two rounds out. See how tight they are? Yeah. You get two out, and then holding the cylinder, you would fill two cylinders, go back, pry out two more rounds. See all the fun you could have in the old days? <laughs> This is, of course, the leather's old here and it's probably shrunk a little. It had to be snug so you wouldn't lose the round. Have two. And fill two more. And then go back and to cheat this time. Alright. But you had a little leather box that you would drop open up the pouch and six rounds would fall into your hand mm -hmm. and then you would just load them keeping your eye on the target and on your opponent I should say while you were doing this and then once you got them all in you closed it and moved back into it. Now you hear that one? Yeah. Right now, it was too light. Grab my cleaning rod and jam it down. There's one jammed in there. 
That is, whenever you hear it go bad like that, do not fire another round. So I would have had a bullet barrel or an explosion here. Okay, that's jammed in there good. This gun will, I'll have to, when I get home, get a metal rod of some sort and hammer that in. But that's an example of what we call a squib load. Okay? Squib loads, okay. A I've squib load before. means there's not enough powder in it. Something yeah. went wrong and it's jammed. Basically, it, it entered the forcing cone and couldn't go any further. Mm -hmm. All right? So, what's going to have to happen is. I'm going to have to use something else at home, like a metal rod, and hammer this one out. But if I had fired another round, if I hadn't stopped, you'd probably get a bulge and a blast, okay? I mean, this is an old box of 38 Special Reloads, 3D company. Uh -huh. I think they went out of business. <laughs> I'm not even sure that's their ammo. Somebody else could have loaded this and I just stuck it in that box, so. Now, this one here, there was a primer hit, but it didn't go off. Yeah. Well, we were firing factory loads. That's why another reason, you gotta be careful with any kind of reloads, particularly if they're old. But this one here will be, so this one here will be retired until I get home and I can stick a good rod in there and, and, and get the, uh, the round out. I mean, yeah, not the round, the, the bullet out. Okay. So that's a safety lesson for everybody here. Yep. Now, the safety lesson that I saw was that when you check the barrel, you... Yeah. You eject that out, and you actually look down the barrel. Mm hmm But I could see light through my fingernail, which I couldn't do. The last time that happened, I saw light. Again, with an automatic, uh, looking down the barrel's a little different. Yeah. <laughs> with a revolver, you know, that's out. But uh, as soon as that made that sound, that's an indicator something was wrong. That and that's not, called a squib load. Yeah, and that was probably a squib load. Didn't have enough powder in it. And uh, very unlikely when you use factory ammunition. Very unlikely. They have so many quality control checks that'll prevent something like that from happening. Mm -hmm. But uh, I said I, I went and grabbed you know, a box. Straight in there for it, just cover it up. What? I don't know what it's for. Alright, anything else you uh, want to shoot yet? Or? Yeah, off to the... Huh? Love. You want me to do this? Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, this is a six inch barrel. Canadian marked, commercial finish. Checkered Griff's medallion, early, that's the early war guns that were purchased. Basically, they took commercial guns and, and you know, issued them right out. And then, you know, they realized they didn't need the fancy finish or anything else. All right, let's see what I can do with this one here. Smith & Wesson 38 S&W. Okay. Okay. Do one more time. Okay. We'll just we fired this one too, haven't we? Yeah, fired that okay. one. It's dirty already. I'm gonna be cleaning them. Don't worry. <laughs> A 
lot less bite than a uh, special. Now we discussed about um, before the names of the Smith and Wesson uh, victory models. Mm -hmm. uh, Model 10, M and P. Which came first? Uh, military and police, and then and then basically there was there was different changes. By the time World War II rolled along, this was like called the fourth model, and becomes a victory when they sell when they hit one million, and they decide to change you know start the number system over again, and they put the V in front of it. So this gun, you know, I would call it a victory model, but technically it's under a million, and it doesn't have the V in front of it because of that. Mm -hmm. But there's no change, okay. You know, if you're a purist, you can argue, well, you know, it doesn't have the V, but, but the finish and everything else is the same at this point. Five inch barrel, standard, common. Standard Commonwealth caliber. So the 38 200 was uh, a 38 Smith and Wesson with a 200 grain bullet, but by the time the 1930s they had gone to a 173 grain full metal jacket. And uh, that met their their military need because that's the caliber they use for their Enfield revolvers and their Webleys. Yeah. All right. All right, Stan. Thanks for the presentation. Okay.